I hope that got you in the right mood. And I, I, now you know all the stuff that we have on this campus that you might not have even been aware of, things that are at your disposal when you come and check in with us. In the meantime, our honored guest, Deputy Provost Robert Whelan, has arrived, and he will address us. Welcome, everybody, to our first session of the Tech Technology and Education Series. And please, Dr. Robert, come up here. Yes, give him a big hand. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Dr. York. Uh, I just want to repeat something I mentioned at a workshop that uh, the CETL and uh, some people from Ugru ran um, last week, in which I pointed out that applause at the beginning of an academic presentation represents faith, uh, applause in the middle represents hope, and applause at the end usually represents charity. Um, so I was always worried when people applaud at the beginning of a presentation. But in this case, I think the applause really ought to be aimed at uh, the organisers of uh, what you might call a professional development program such as this, a series of seminars in technology and education. <clears throat> Between the time when the previous provost um, Professor Rory Hume had the idea for a se provost seminar series in technology and education. Between that time and now, there has actually been a technology and education revolution dropped on us or injected into us because, as in all of you, I'm sure, will know that the Chancellor has been very enthusiastic about uh, developing the use of iPad technology in education and so we've been running the iPad project, which really now is effectively a mobile learning project because it's not really about just about the technology. It's about how we integrate the technology into our teaching, how we improve or use the technology to improve the delivery and creation, indeed, of content and its delivery, and how we improve the pedagogy, the way we use it in the classroom. And so, the, in a sense, this seminar series has been given additional emphasis by the projects that uh, are happening right around the university. So with the success of the, uh, all the people in the foundations programs who assumed uh, the responsibility for developing teaching using the iPad, with that happening, and with the announcement of the success in our college or in my course. And uh, so we've discovered that these requests are coming from people teaching in the general education program, from people teaching in degree programs with specific even high level courses in the senior level of undergraduate degree programs. And they came from a master's program in business administration where an external company contracting masters and MBA degree, contracting us to deliver an MBA, wanted it delivered on the iPad. And so right around the university, there are individuals who are keen to learn about how this technology, a tablet technology, might be able to be used in their discipline area. The interesting thing is that there were a lot of activities going on in technology and education prior to this project. Uh, there are people around the university developing uh, technological innovations and linking them to content delivery and linking them to pedagogy. We've seen it in the medical faculty, College of Medicine, we've seen it in the IT college, right around the university. And so one of the things that universities generally find very difficult is communicating examples of best practice from one part of the university to another the people who develop an innovation that might work in the biological sciences uh, may well contain some lessons that would be transportable or portable into another discipline area. 
And so this seminar series that uh, Dr. Jörg has you know, hosted that the, under the, um, uh, the name of the provost, um, this seminar series is critical to that communication process. Uh, so I'd really l like to thank you for coming to the first one of this series in this semester, um, but ask you also to think of it more broadly than just being entertained by the person giving the presentation. This is really meant to be a process of seizing lessons that somebody else has learned through an initiative and working out how you might adopt them, change them, modify them uh, to be of some benefit in your teaching or with one of your colleagues. Because I hope that in this set of seminars, what we will see is some cross-fertilisation between different discipline areas, but all with the same objective of looking at how we might improve the way in which we teach by a three-way integration of technology, content development, delivery, and pedagogy, the use of that in teaching. And I think in today's seminar, we have absolutely the perfect uh, one to kick off with, and so I'd really like to stop taking up your time and devote the time to the person who really knows what they're talking about. So I'd like to hand over at this point to our speaker for today. And I'm wondering if you are going to walk around with this or if we'll line up. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Whalen. And thank you all so much for coming. Yes, thanks. So I'm very excited to be here today because I, I wanted to talk today because I hoped that by sharing our experiences in Ugru, we could be helpful or informative to other areas of the university moving forward with technology. So first, I'll talk about some of my own personal experiences, and then I'll talk about how they had an impact on everything I've done in Ukru. So I went to university before the internet. And when I finished university, I started working in schools in far-flung locations that had absolutely no technology, schools where it was a good day if you could sign out the tape recorder for a lesson. And so um, in 2000, I moved back to America and I began working at a daily newspaper. And so I found that I didn't know even the most basic technology. I didn't know Word very well. And so I had to catch up and I had to catch up fast. And so I know that I never could have done that without the help and support of extremely patient people who would never make me feel stupid for asking the same questions a hundred times over and over. And so uh, later I returned to teaching and I uh, went to grad school and I got my master's in TESOL and I spent a summer teaching at the English language program at the University of Pennsylvania. And I found that uh, I was really impressed they had great technology available for us to use. We had beautiful PC podiums, and they had remotes that could turn your, uh, you know, open the doors and reveal a screen, and then reveal another smart board, and it was fantastic. But most notable about that experience was the people who were working there were so excited about using it, and they were sincerely enthusiastic about sharing whatever they knew with anyone who wanted to know it. And so, um, just after that, I came to the UAE and I worked at an institution that offered a wide variety of uh, professional development. And uh, some of it was required, some of it was optional, and they also had a, a secret weapon. And that was a great leader in technology who was an English teacher who made fantastic decisions about what was going to help us in the classroom, and he was fantastic 
about teaching us how to use it. And every time I went to those sessions, I found it was really helpful because it was relevant to my experience. I was in a laptop classroom and I was eager to do anything that was going to make my classroom more engaging or more efficient or more fun or anything. So it was, it was at that time a few years ago when I had a turning point. So I was going to every PD I could and you know sometimes I could just get it and, and move on and I was fine. And then other times I found that I would get stuck. I would go to a session, I would go to my desk and start working on my, uh, my blog or working on my quiz or working on my activity and I would get stuck. I would click, it wouldn't work, I got frustrated, I didn't know what to do. So uh, I had backup. So I would call the coordinator when I got stuck and I said, look, I'm trying to do a Wimba Create lesson and I need help. And he's like, look, I have no time, I'm completely busy, but this is what you can do. You come to my office. Right? And so his office was set up. He had an L-shaped desk and then he had another table set up. And so he's like, look, you sit at this table, you go ahead, you work on your lesson, you work on your blog, and I'm just gonna be over here doing my job, right? Just, I'm gonna be here working. So if you have a problem, you just let me know. And so that's exactly what I did. I got stuck and I said, I, I click the thing and it, and it will go. And he would say, okay, click the other thing first. And so I said, okay, thank you. And he returned to his work, I returned to mine, and I got the help I needed when I needed it in a really quick, efficient way. And that was what I think sent me forward much faster than I would have if I had to go to online help desks or go through a thousand YouTube videos looking for ways to solve the problem myself. So sometimes having a backup plan can be the most efficient way of getting the help you need and moving forward. So I came to Ubru in fall 2011 and it was a big change for me because I, I didn't have laptops. So everyone was uh, using paper textbooks, uh, worksheets, and um, I, you know, on the women's campus, we were fortunate enough to have smart boards, but at the men's campus, it was markers. And so um, I still found that I was really excited and really uh, enthusiastic to, to use technology and to share whatever I knew. So, in uh, spring 2012, one year ago, we had an opportunity. Um, I was scheduled for two classes, and one of them was working fine. The other, uh, because of fluctuations in student numbers, I hadn't seen any students for a couple of days. So I asked my coordinator, uh, level two coordinator, Darren Downing, um, what should I do? I have no students. What's, what's happening? And he said, well, you could wait a couple of days and you'll get some students. Or if you have an idea, you could do like a project and then you can maybe get released. And so you'll stay with one class and then you can do your project. And so I was like, okay, well, that's interesting. What kind of projects do people usually do? What do we do here? And he's like, well, you could do a technology project. And so I was like, yeah, I'll do a technology project. So I went back to my desk and in 30 minutes, 60 minutes, I created a proposal, and I think the same day, I was able to send it on to, uh, to my boss, Mark Hill, and I think it was very quickly approved, and in very short order, a project was born. So this was the proposal. So I don't have any computer science background, I have no superpowers, right, but I knew four things that I thought could help people. And I chose uh, things that would give the greatest benefit for the time in exchange for the time invested in learning them. So I chose blogs, online polls and quizzes, um, Edmodo, and interactive collaborative documents. And I offered just little tiny workshops on a variety of days, a variety of days. So Monday at two, Wednesday at four, Sunday at 10, at a variety of times, and I repeated them over and over because I remember that helped me in the past. And I also said, if you want to try this in the classroom, we'll go to your classroom. If you want help at your desk, we'll go to your desk. 
If you want uh, help in a lab, we'll go to a lab. So whatever works for you, that's how we'll do it. And that was what I, that was my idea. And so I wasn't sure if I was successful or not in the beginning because in about four or six weeks, the, the sessions were really, really small. Most of the time it was only like three or five people or two or one coming to my sessions. But I also saw that I had repeat customers. People would come again and again for all different things. And people were asking for help and I was happy to give it. So in four to six weeks, I worked with about 20 to 30 teachers. And so even though I wasn't sure if I was successful, I still felt that more could be done and should be done. And so uh, I, and I also knew that there were people who could do things better than me. And so I tried to find out who they were. And so I worked with our leadership at Ubru to uh, make arrangements, to give them the time to do these workshops, to spend the time with teachers so that um, they would get the help that they need. And so I was very fortunate. Leadership paved the way for me. And I think from the day I walked into Razak's office, uh, I think I went to his office in the afternoon at maybe two or three. And I think by close of business that same day, I saw the wheels start moving. And I was incredibly grateful. So, you know, I still wasn't sure if we had it right because the numbers were still so small. And uh, I, I felt discouraged. And so then, Sunday Richard noticed something great. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. So Sunday is uh, a member of our first generation of e-learning trainers. And she is extremely talented. And this is what she said. One of the things I enjoyed most about being part of the e-learning committee was talking to teachers about their ideas and having those ideas influence the way I think about using technology. And then having those teachers walk out of a session with something new to use. Excuse me. So she makes two very important points. One of them is that we had a chance to hear what teachers needed. We only had a few people in there. So that was a, a good environment for teachers to say what they needed and wanted in their classroom, what, what would help them. So we got to hear from them. And then the other thing is that when we had a workshop of three people or five people, they walked out like, yeah, OK, I can do that, like ready to go. And you know what? I remember having done uh, sessions, larger sessions of, say, 20 people and feeling at the end of the hour like, are, they, are 20 people really going to walk out of here and do that? Are they really going to walk out of here and start this blog? Are they really going to walk out of here and do their audio slideshows? Is this really going to happen? And so my, my guess was maybe one or two were ready to go. But if you had a session with four and four were ready to go, that wasn't so bad. So I think we don't just go to a big session and see it and then get it and we're not just ready to go sometimes. Sometimes there are levels of understanding and that understanding has to uh, develop sometimes over time and through a variety of ways. And so I found in my previous experiences that I would go to a session a few times. I think I went to Edmodo like three times before I was really ready to create my group, bring it into my class, and start my students on it. And I also found that you know it really helped. Like, where's the button? Just having someone to ask really, really helped. And so that's what the uh, Ugru English e-learning team has tried to give over the past year. So we give workshops, and we repeat them. And then we do them by request. So if there is something that you want to know, we will do it for you. And also, we give one-to-one -one help at your desk, in your classroom. Whatever you need, we'll get it to you. And it was the idea of a teacher 
to do a question and answer session at the same time in the same place every, uh, every week. And there would just be an e-learning team member there ready to answer questions and help. And we also let people come into our classrooms and see how the technology worked. So they would have a full understanding before they had to take the sometimes scary step of moving forward with a new technology with 20 uh, very energetic young people. So, okay. We had to see whether we were successful. We were now a, a team of five. And we have to see, well, is it working? And so uh, the Ugru English department is about 150 people. And so this semester, about 90 uh, teachers sought the help or attended a workshop with the e-learning team. And so, wow, we had, of those 90 people surveyed, 82 responded. Thanks, guys. OK. OK. So getting great big numbers of people into a room is great, but it isn't necessarily success. An another part of success is getting people to use the technology that they came to learn. And so we asked. 80% of the people who surveyed said that they have used the technology they came to learn. So we wanted to know how often they use it. Is it something they just tried once or twice? Is it something they use once in a while? Is it something that they're using every day? And so 62% said they're using it regularly at least once a week. 29% said they did it once or twice. And 10% said they use it occasionally. So um, this is interesting because it also reflects the different kinds of technology. You would be using a content delivery option you know, daily or every class or at least every week. But there's other kinds of technology that we, you would only use once in a while, like a special, uh, excuse me, a special activity or a special game or something like this. So this is consistent. So of those 20% who said they hadn't used the technology they came to learn, we asked them, do you think you'll use it in the future? 87% said yes. So we asked them, do you like the technology that you learned? It's kind of a vague question. It's not very scientific. But we really just wanted a vague idea of whether this was helpful or useful to the people who came to learn it. 92% of the people who answered the question said yes. But only 60 people who answered the survey said yes. I'll explain this. But still, it's, so I'm saying it's not quite as sunny as 92% think it's great. This is the more accurate thing. So 82 people answered the survey. 60 people said yes, they liked it. So that actually means that 73% of the people who uh, came to learn the technology said they liked it. So if you were here earlier, you may have seen already on the screen some of the answers to this question. So 63% of the people who came to us said that, their, yes, their uh, attitude toward technology has changed. And only two people skipped this question. So how? How did their attitude toward technology change? That's my favorite. So comfort and confidence is important as we move forward with technology. It can be incredibly intimidating to try something new with 20 or so lively, talkative young people. And you know, because if things go wrong, it can be a destabilizer for your classroom. When you try something new, you want to do your best to make sure that it's going to work. And so if people are feeling more comfortable 
in taking that step into trying something new, I'm deeply pleased. Here's another trend. Not as scared, not as afraid, less afraid, more comfortable, less scared. So people were scared. It is scary when you find out that you are going to be given an extremely sophisticated, powerful device that means that you have to change absolutely everything you do in your job, and you are going to have to master, to some extent, that device itself, but also develop a familiarity with the associated apps and programs that you need to know to use the device to its maximum potential. It was scary. But I think, you know, what worked for us in Ugru, what helped us move forward, was the aspect of a community of sharing and support. You know, like, whatever works for you, we'll do it. And that was what we wanted to do. And that was our goal. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not Steve Jobs. I, you know, do not have a superconductor at home. But if what, whatever I know, I will share it with you patiently and so right we had layers of help and uh, one of the things I think we could have done more is be more creative in how we delivered uh, our, PE, our, our sessions I think that there is a lot of opportunities here uh, I know one uh, university has uh, set up a genius bar uh, Apple style and they have IT students help teachers learn how to use the basics of their iPad. And I also saw at an iCelebrate event, um, you could have a table of sort of show and tell stations where every five minutes you can have a teacher show off their favorite app or their favorite idea. And then after five minutes, everyone switches tables and goes to a different idea or a different uh, piece of technology. And I think. We were very busy people last semester. A lot of people were on overtime, and that means six straight hours of teaching, plus committee work, plus uh, office hours. So if someone had 20 stolen minutes at their desk and wanted to learn how to do something with technology, then we wanted to be there. We wanted to at least meet them halfway. So if it meant going to their desk, if it meant go, making a special session, then that was what we wanted to do. So the e-learning team would not have existed without the help and support of Darren Downing and Mark Hill and the entire Ugru leadership. And I, I have to say something about the e-learning trainers. Yes, you know who you are. Uh, it's a very special person who was an e-learning trainer because it's not enough just to know about technology. You have to be sincerely enthusiastic about sharing whatever you know and helping people. And that's what I think the e-learning teams were. So uh, Generation 1.0 blazed the trail. And uh, Generation 2.0 was really, you know, this past fall, the team who was with iPads in the first semester this past fall, they were in the eye of the storm, and I think they deserve a hand. So David Rumps, Clark Davis, and Tamara Poss. So yes, you are fantastic, and we are deeply grateful. But I also have to say something for every teacher who stepped up to the challenge, because OK, we tried to organize things as much as we could and sort of deliver some system in which people can count on. But there was another support system that I didn't even know about, or I only got glimpses of. And that is teachers who teach the same course or uh, something similar, sitting together next to each other at their desks, talking about what they did in class yesterday, and what worked for them, and what didn't, and how you can do the same thing too. A very quiet, caring, sharing, help and support among teachers who really rose to the challenge. And so, if there's one thought that I could, that I can leave you with today, it is that of community. I think uh, 
sorry, I'm having like Marco Rubio here. I'm just like really thirsty. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Thanks for laughing. Yeah. So it's it's scary to have a, a new device change everything that you do in your job. But if you work with everyone that you know to share everything you know for the benefit of all of your of your team, then you can not only get past the challenges, but I think you can become better for it. And when we become better, I think our, the experience of our students becomes brighter and more engaging. And they experience university and UAEU in a whole new way. So community, I hope this helps. Thank you for an inspiring, enthusiastic talk. And I think there will be some questions for Pamela. So I will run around with the microphone. If you hold up your hands, and then we can all hear you. I'm on my way. Anyone? Pam, I'm sure that uh, we'd like to see this replicated throughout the university. Uh, have you been thinking about that? And uh, what sort of steps do you think we can take to try and, and do that? I think uh, it can be replicated throughout any department. But uh, I think it's something that has to be special to be something that works for each discipline. And that you know the, those professors or those instructors themselves should in some way decide what is going to work for them because they know the programs that are going to work for them. Science people know the science, right? So I leave that up to them. But um, yeah, I think the general idea, I think the, the most ideas, find a community, build layers of support, be creative, and oh, and make it as convenient as possible to as many people as possible. I think those are the guiding, the guiding concepts. Hey, it's a good point. Oop. Thank you very much for this lecture. Um, uh, what technology did you use in your teaching and how it improved uh, learning? I think I delivered my content through, uh, mostly through a blog and something called Edmodo, which is very similar. It's like a baby Facebook, and it's secure. So um, you just only your students can get to your group. 
And uh, I also use lots of uh, grammar practice activities that have been shared with me from my colleagues. And um, I think each kind of technology that you use has its own way of uh, promoting learning. So if you just reduce the amount of time spent on practicalities and logistics in your classroom, then you have more time for the serious business, for the learning. And also, if you can make what you do in the classroom more dynamic, more beautiful, more interactive, more exciting, more interesting to your students, then you'll just have more attention and more cognitive presence within the lesson. And so that, I think, is helpful. And then another thing that I think technology enables us to do is it enables us to give them resources and tools that they could use wherever they are, anytime. You know, that's mobile learning, anywhere, anytime you have access to it. And so I think, you know, that's, that itself could be its own lecture. But I hope I've answered your question in some way. Yeah. Uh, did you make any statistics uh, and study in uh, that shows uh, learning is improved? Well, I think, you know, does technology improve learning or has the iPad improved learning? I think in this, we have not had enough time with the iPad to determine, in my opinion, like a, a really robust uh, answer to that question, a statistically sound answer to that question. And I think, you know, it's to me very difficult to say because I'm, I'm a pre-test, post-test yeah, kind of person. So it's time uh, to to um, um, to know how much and it affects learning and from time to time accumulated data it needs over years probably. Yeah, I personally do not have a PhD for with the longitudinal study that would satisfy that question. But here's what I believe. I believe that when I use technology and when my students like it and it works well, I think they light up. And I think they pay attention in a way that they didn't in, you know, in times and places when I wasn't using technologies. I, and I think, you know, that, that's my answer. They light up. But I think Dr. Whalen? Well, I just wanted to, this is more of a comment in r relation to the last question than a question in itself. It seems to me, and one thing I've focused on a lot as the iPad project has evolved, is to stop asking the question, did the iPad improve learning? Because really the question is, did the way in which we use the iPad improve learning? Yeah, uh, but a lot of people do. And the point I made earlier is everybody wants, to, wants an iPad, so I can teach with an I, using an iPad. And, um, I, and that makes the, the asking of the question, the assessment task that you're looking for, makes it quite difficult because it's not just a with and without technology question, it's a, it's, a, it's a research question that says, did the change in the way I did my teaching influence learning? So getting the cause and effect is very difficult in that, in that case because it's a multifactorial type um, uh, analysis. Um, but we do know that increased engagement of students generally leads to improved learning and we can measure engagement. And so I think there is there's some elements to this that we can start to get at with the assessment task. And it's going to be very interesting as we move forward. But the assessment that we're going to be doing is about how is the way in which we are teaching differently affecting the way in which students are learning. And um, well, Pamela's going to be involved in some of that, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah, and we're just at the beginning, you know, but now is the time where we can slowly start. And this was focusing on faculty experience and not so much on student responses. How did this change my learning? And I think that's another thing we need to look at in the long run. Any other comments or questions? I've just thought of another one. Um, great example for everybody we could use with our students of confounding variables um, in an analysis. We introduced 
the iPad to teaching English at the same time as we increase the number of hours, I think from 13 to 17. So we will never know whether it was the number of hours increased or the integration of the technology and teaching that resulted in an increased pass rate from something like 57, 50 something percent to 80 something percent. Somebody here would know. Do you? Can you just yell or do I need to run? <laughs> We added four hours actually the semester before we had the iPads and it was only to level one English. Uh, we did see a bump. Uh, we saw a bigger bump in the fall. It would be premature to say whether it was related to iPad use. We're going to have to see how those students do in level two because the assessment that was related to the extra four hours, it was the first time we had done because we, we, we changed uh, what we did in those four hours from one semester to another. So it was the first time that we had uh, had done that and assessed it. So it's always possible that the, it's the, the marks may have been easier to come by and that could have bumped uh, the pass rates up significantly because the, pass rate, or the, the average grade tends to hover around 60%. So if you get a couple marks, can make a big difference. Uh, the rate did go up. Um, it was about 83%, which was the highest it's been in 10 years, uh, from an average of about 70% uh, for that level. But as I say, it's, it would be premature uh, to directly link that to the iPad, not to mention that we really didn't see that sort of thing in the other two levels, which only had the iPad as a variable. Now, something else we did see that was very interesting was in our IT course. The IT program completely revamped its course to take advantage of the technology, and not only in the content, but also in the assessment, which I think is a really big matter. Because if you're going to try and, and capture the potential gains of mobile learning, you have to ask yourself whether your current assessment is able to do that. And the IT program, basically, um, what they did was they took iPad literacy uh, and they, they facilitated iPad literacy uh, for students when they first got there. And then they used uh, an inquiry-based learning approach for the, the course itself. So there, there wasn't any content per se. The idea was to, uh, was to help the students to get some kind of a foundation in research in uh, inquiry-based learning. And we had a very high pass rate, uh, which was considered good because the course was not considered uh, a prerequisite to anything, but rather a support course. But we had um, a, a middling grade of around 70%. So it wasn't that students were all getting high marks. Uh, they were getting average grades. And a couple things that were interesting, one was the fact that there was a lot of self and peer assessment, and we were quite pleased to see that students were not taking advantage of that to give themselves free grades, but were actually really critically assessing themselves and others. There was also reflection that was done in the course. Students had to write essays uh, at the end of the course to reflect on their learning. And the thing I noticed, I sat in on the course for about half the semester, and two things that I felt were achieved, which, were, which are somewhat intangible, not really measured by our assessment, but I think really count in life and in further study. And that was creativity. Students were given opportunities. We often hear talk about uh, facilitating creative and critical thinking, but less often we actually see it in practice. And there were opportunities, and students took advantage of those opportunities to do things that they never had done uh, in, in school before, I'm sure, and, and didn't do in other classes. And the other thing was empowerment. You could see that students felt that the playing field was somewhat leveled from what they were used to, where the teacher was here and the students were here. And uh, I remember one student in particular commenting on this. She didn't use the word empowerment, but that's what she was talking about. And it was in a positive way, that the students felt like they actually could take more responsibility uh, for determining the outcome of their learning and they were not just passive recipients of knowledge. So I think that this course in particular has, has shown us 
what some of the uh, some of the potential of mobile learning is for the future. Not really measurable at this point, not quantifiable, but qualitatively you can see it in the classroom and hopefully it will pay dividends as these students go on in Ugru and, and come to you. Thank you, Paul. These are very important points. They are so-called intangibles and we teach more than just our subject matter. There's dealing with technology and being getting prepared for the world that's out there waiting for them that we also need to disseminate to our students. I'm going to call it quits, I almost said. I'm going to, it's approaching five o'clock and people are ready to go home. Thank you again, Pamela, for this inspiring presentation. Please tell all your colleagues about what we're doing here, that it is indeed interdisciplinary and that they should come by learn new tricks. Somebody said, we don't know what we don't know, and there's lots that they might not know that we will present here. Okay. Let me tell you what's coming up in our program next. Well, it's not weekly this time, because last year we noticed that it's getting too much. People are busy, and it's also not always on the same day. This semester we will alternate between Tuesdays and Wednesdays to give people a chance who are teaching on Tuesday to attend Wednesday sessions and vice versa. And it's on a bi-weekly cycle, kind of. Unless there's a break in between. So our next presentation will be on March 6th, and that's a Wednesday. David Rums will talk to us about Moodle and learning, man uh, learning management systems. He's here right now. And after that, March 19th, that's a Tuesday again. We will have Dr. Ryan from the business school talking on a project, uh, student-created learning resources. So, of course, broadcasts will go out. Recommend us to all your friends and peers. Thank you for coming, and have a good rest of the week. Thank you. <laughs>